Our next speaker, he's the author of the most popular Harry Potter fan fiction online. <laughs> yes, really. It's called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. <laughs> All right, here we go. Elysia Yukowski. Am I? Is the microphone on? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, I am known for one or two other things, really. <laughs> uh, most notably, uh, the keywords Singularity Institute and Less Wrong are what you may have heard associated. All right, so I hope I didn't scare off any of you earlier by sheer bad luck, if there were such a thing as bad luck. Um, the most mathematical t uh, slide in this entire talk came on by accident before. It's not all going to be like that. So if any of you left the room and can't hear this, I'd like to uh, ask you to come back in. <laughs> anyway, hello, Skepticon. I can't believe I'm here. You're all very friendly. I guess it's true what they say. Missouri loves company. <laughs> and this thing doesn't work, so how does this thing? None of these things work. All right, there we go. Does this work? Yes, it does. All right, so. There's this uh, little experiment they ran once upon a time, and don't worry, it'll be clear very soon why this is relevant, where they showed students a uh, six-sided die with four green faces, three red faces, uh, sorry, two red faces. The uh, die was rolled 20 times. You get a series of green and reds showing up, and you were asked to choose a sequence. And if your sequence showed up in the sequence of 20 rolls, you would win $25. Now, in that problem, would you bet on RGRRR coming up, GRGRRR coming up, or GRRRRRR? <laughs> Thank you, but it's not international talk like a pirate day <laughs> yet. So, 65% chose sequence two in case where 125 undergraduates played this game with real payoffs. Now, what's the gotcha? The gotcha is that sequence one dominates sequence two because any time sequence two appears, sequence one necessarily appears. What do we learn from this experiment? Well, actually, not just this experiment, but about 1,000 experiments, all in the same basic theme. We want to choose the most probable sequence. Um, our brain, in lieu of actually calculating out the numbers, runs off and substitute the sequence that looks the most like the die, giving rise to a conjunction fallacy. It's called the conjunction fallacy because it violates the conjunction rule of probability theory, which is that the probability of A, whether or not B happens, is always equal to or higher than the probability of both A and B happening. Here's another experiment along the same theme. Uh, Tversky and Kahneman went off to the Second International Congress on Forecasting in 1982 and asked two different groups who didn't know about each other, uh, professional forecasters, analysts, people who did this for a living, um, to rate the probability of Group one, a complete suspension of diplomatic relations between the USA and the Soviet Union sometime in 1983. Version two, a Russian invasion of Poland and a complete suspension of diplomatic relations between the USA and the Soviet Union sometime in 1983. And the group rating version two responded with significantly higher probabilities, which is another case of the conjunction fallacy because here we have the composite event, A and B, here we have A alone. And the probability of this cannot be higher than the probability of that. Now, what's the moral? Let's see. Yeah. Hold on. Um, and the moral is that even though adding detail to an event makes the necessarily, mathematically, 
makes the event less probable, that same addition of detail can make the event sound more plausible. Once you realize this, you realize there is a really, you start to notice this really sharp dichotomy between people who are making up lots of plausible sounding details, or they have a few parts of their speech that sound really good, and try to average that out with the more implausible parts they tack on later versus people who are sort of taking apart their explanation into pieces and asking of each and every piece, do I have this evidence to support this detail apart from all the other details? Occam's razor, more complicated hypotheses are less likely a priori. That doesn't mean that they're always and eternally be less likely. It means they require more evidence before you believe them. Uh, Richard Carrier tomorrow, I hope, will probably talk about prior probabilities, which will formalize it. Now, this talk should really have come after Richard Carrier's, but I'm just going to try to, like, kick everything forward to him that he's going to cover in his talk. So Occam's razor says that the simplest explanation that best fits the evidence is most likely to be true, but what is the simplest explanation? Robert Heinlein, I believe, once said that the simplest explanation is always the lady down the street is a witch. She did it. <laughs> Better yet, let's abbreviate that. <laughs> Tudis Yodsi. Now it's even simpler, just a single word. Tudis Yodsi. Nope, nothing magical happens when I say that. So the formal reply to this version of Occam's razor is known as minimum message length. And the core of it is to ask, the woman down the street is a what? She did what? Part one, what exactly are we saying the woman down the street is? Now, if you'll forgive a bit of a digression, this here is Thor, the thunder god. He is an explanation for lightning. Is he a simple explanation? Well, compared to, say, Maxwell's equations, which I put up over here in, in lieu of actually saying anything about electricity or bothering to look up any actual equations governing lightning bolts, because I was lazy. <laughs> but let's pretend that these are the actual equations governing lightning, even though they're really the equations governing electromagnetism. Um, which of these is the simpler hypothesis? Well, to a human, a thunder god sounds much simpler than calculus because it takes years before you get up to the point of understanding calculus. You know, like, even if you start early and proceed as fast as possible, it's still going to be years between when you're learning to solve like, multiple equations and multiple unknowns at age seven and when you get up to calculus at 11 or whatever. But if you are a computer programmer, you soon discover that it is much harder to program Thor the Intelligent Thunder Agent than it is to program a simulation of Maxwell's equations or any other sort of merely physical explanation of lightning. The laws of the universe would appear to be written in math rather than heroic mythology, but we invented heroic mythology tens of thousands of years earlier because it sounds simpler to a human even though it's not. Even though the math of Maxwell's equations are vastly simpler in an absolute sense than any program you could write to simulate Thor if you were writing it out formally rather than using your own brain to simulate Thor's mind. So we had a sort of poor language for our hypotheses, one in which very complicated things could be described using very short messages, and very simple things required very long messages. Um, I'm actually going to digress a bit now to explain another thing that Richard Carrier said. <clears throat> so I once met a fellow who claimed that he had experience as a Navy gunner. I'm a bit skeptical that he actually did because he said, when you fire artillery shells, you've got to compute the trajectories using Newtonian mechanics. If you compute the trajectories using relativity, you'll get the wrong answer because at low speeds, 
physics is governed by Newtonian laws. So I said, no. <laughs> and someone else who also happened to be standing there also said, no. And Newton is a sort of cheap approximation to relativity. It works at low speeds and breaks down at high speeds. Um, basically, you can compute your answers more cheaply at low speeds and get them almost right by using the Newtonian approximation. That's not what this guy thought, though. He thought that there were these two different modes the universe ran in. There was the relativity mode at high speed, and then the laws of physics switched gears. God depressing the clutch <laughs> as you went down to low speeds, and then it went down to Newton's laws. That would be an awfully weird universe to live in. Makes me want to try it. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm not God? <laughs> Yet. So what this guy didn't quite understand is that all of the reality that we see, all the reality that we model, is in essence a approximation. Like, I see this controller devicey thingy in my hand, but what's actually down there is atoms. Well, actually what's down there is quarks. Well, actually what's down there is quantum fields, unless there's something underneath that. But the point is that there isn't a sort of, if I, you say, look at a Boeing 747, then I have separate beliefs about the wings of that Boeing 47, 747, which I model using my parietal cortex, which was about here somewhere, and models spatial things. And separately, I have beliefs about quarks and quantum physics, which is modeled using a rather different part of my mind. But in reality itself, there's only the quarks. There's only the quantum fields. There's no, the, the wings of the 747 are implicit within the quantum fields. They exist as separate elements of my map, but not as separate and additional elements of reality. Um, the multiple levels of organization exist in the map, in the mind, not in the territory, not in the environment. Reality itself appears to be a single, unified, mathematically simple process. This brings me to the best definition of the supernatural that I have ever heard, best definition I've ever heard of what it is we don't believe in. It comes from Richard Carrier. <laughs> Since he's explaining Bayes' theorem, and I you know, spend a lot of time running around explaining Bayes' theorem, I figured I'd explain his theories instead. <laughs> so, wonderful, exciting news. We went up to a tree and the sort of green, translucent female thingy came out of it. It's a dryad. Really exciting, right? Lots of people get really excited about that. You know people who get, would get really excited about that or you wouldn't be annoyed enough to come here. But let's say we actually put the stride under a microscope. Well, it'd have to be a really sharp microscope, but we discover that she's made of quarks. Or, you know, not even quarks, some other sort of particle that's obeying mathematical rules. Well, now she's boring. Now she's just physics. Now she's just normal. Now she's just mundane. Now she's just real. So Richard Carrier's definition of the supernatural is that supernatural models contain ontologically basic mental elements. Now what the heck does that mean? Um, ontological means the stuff that stuff is made of. So ontologically basic mental elements means that in your model of reality, there's the stuff that's inherently mental and that you can't take apart into pieces that are formal, causal, mathematical, like cause and effect without any sort of mindish elements in them. And when you know that this is how you define the supernatural, you can get all the woo in one shot. It's awesome. Astrology? Well, those distant stars are casting influences over your personality. There's some sort of law of physics that relates where the stars are to your personality. It's easy to say in human language, 
but it's very difficult to say in mathematical language. It comes out much more, in a, looking much more complicated if you try to program a computer program that would do that than if you just say it in English. And most importantly, it's got ontologically basic mental elements. The laws of physics are over things like the relation of your stars to your personality. You get God, obviously. There's this like sort of basic irreducible mental thingy that's playing a basic role in the explanation for why everything exists. You get, you know, like sort of people who say, well, you know, like the Buddhists are okay. They don't believe in God, which is on a scale of one to ten, its truth value is about like a three maybe. Um, but, they, but if you believe in karma, you believe in an ontologically basic mindish sort of thing. You believe that there are laws of the universe that operate over things like sin, and, or not really sin, but like good deeds and so on. And these are laws over mindish things rather than quarkish things, mathish things. You get the entire spread of woo in one shot. You even get the consciousness causes collapse interpretation of quantum mechanics which may be more dignified because physicists used to believe it, but is still supernatural. If looking at particles or knowing things about particles cause them to behave differently, then the basic laws of physics would be over mindish sorts of things. This is the best definition I've ever heard of what it is we don't believe in. It's also why the first and only Matrix movie <laughs> is science fiction rather than fantasy. I mean, you're in the matrix. There are AIs. They can change the code. Are they gods? Well, they're gods that you can take apart into non-mental parts. So unless you have the capacity to be excited about things that are ultimately reducible to math, the gods of the matrix are boring. They're not supernatural. The, so th that's the sort of like the first part of the minimum message length reply to the woman down the street as a witch, she did it, is what exactly is the woman down, a, down the street? She's a witch? Okay, like say formally what that means. Write a computer program that simulates witches. It's a little harder than it looks when you just say it in English. And the second part is what exactly did the woman down the street do? So let's consider the woman down the street is a witch. She made the cylinder roll down the inclined plane <laughs> versus Galileo's theory of gravity was pulling it downward at an accelerating pace. So if I do go to the heroic lengths of writing a computer program that could simulate a witch, after I'm done with that, I still have to specify that First, the witch made it roll uh, one foot in ten, one meter in ten seconds. It's a really inclined plane. First, she made the cylinder roll one meter in ten seconds. Then she uh, made the uh, made it roll four meters in twenty seconds. Then she made it roll nine meters in thirty seconds. Then she made it roll sixteen meters in uh, forty seconds. I have to write out everything the witch did in separate detail. Now, if I write a program that formalizes Galileo's theory of gravity, I just have to write the program to sort of square successive integers and like multiply the squared integer by meters and the unsquared integer by 10 seconds. The point is I can compress the data using Galileo's hypothesis, but not using the witch hypothesis. After I encode Galileo's hypothesis, I can use Galileo's hypothesis to pretty easily print out the time series of the data. You tell me how long the cylinder rolled when it was first released, and then you tell me the time, and I'll tell you the distance it rolled. You, you use the which, you have to encode all the data separately. So the minimum message length formalism says that the best hypothesis is the shortest total message that encodes the hypothesis and uses the hypothesis to output the data. This is the formal version of Occam's razor. 
that is used by sort of advanced, um, well, it's, it's used by people who engage in these sorts of arguments and actually know what all the rules are. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so if you just, so Occam's razor is something that can also be formalized. And it says, it describes how to penalize the probabilities of large, complicated, like even sort of like secretly complicated hypotheses that you have made up out of thin air and which don't tell you very well what to expect to see happen next. This is the underlying rule that governs skepticism. It's why we don't believe in astrology as a, one special case of the things that are governed by this. Another thing um, worth noting is the virtue of precision, being able to say exactly what will happen next. Um, the reason we believe in general relativity, or I should say rather the reason that Einstein first believed in general relativity, we've got a bit more evidence now, is that Mercury was in the wrong place by, I don't remember exactly how many zeros there were in this, it was something like the, the axes were precessing by 0 0.0000043 percent per too much per century. We could measure that, and since Newton's laws couldn't explain it, and general relativity was a mathematically simple explanation that did, he, which he had sort of like not generated by setting his parameters from the precession of Mercury, but it sort of worked out from first principles. This is how I would design a universe and then match to Mercury. That's how Einstein first knew that um, general relativity was correct. And in formal terms, Richard Carrier is probably going to talk something along these lines. Let's say that the true experimental value is 42. And the first hypothesis said, well, the value is going to be somewhere between uh, 20 and 45. And there's like, not inclusive, uh, or 20 and 44, rather. Um, 25, 20 and 44. So there's like 25 permitted possibilities. Then for each one of these possibilities, we've got 4% probability mass to put on that possibility. On the other hand, suppose the second hypothesis says, well, the value is going to be somewhere between 40 and 44. Then the second hypothesis has made, has made a much more impressive prediction. It's made a precise prediction. And because it's, there were only five possibilities that were allowed, it could put, afford to put 20% probability mass on each possibility, which means that this hypothesis assigned five times as much, 4% times 5 is 20%, 5 times as much probability as the first hypothesis, and which is where we will hopefully learn tomorrow Bayesian evidence comes from. It's when one hypo evidence is when one hypothesis sort of predicts more narrowly what will happen, assigns more probability mass to the exact correct answer than some competing hypothesis. Actually, uh, so astrology, you slip in a puddle and fall, and the astrologer says, oh yes, that's caused the influence of Venus. You step in a puddle and you don't fall. The astrologer goes, oh yeah, that's due to the influence of Mars. That you can explain anything using astrology or psychoanalysis, or um, in some cases, certain market pundits. You know, Dow, Dow Jones went up, Dow Jones went down. They can, oh, they've all got an explanation for it, after the fact. And the key idea here is that the goodness of your prediction is not measured by what your theory can explain, but by what it can't explain. This is a stronger theory because it excludes all of these possibilities and thereby ha has more probability to concentrate into this narrow band over here. 
That is, it's a better theory because the prediction actually came true. If instead the, the true value had been over here, this hypothesis would have made a vague but correct prediction. This hypothesis would have made a precise but wrong prediction. But the other thing that all the woo has in common is that no matter what you see happen, they've got an explanation for it. Um, your three-year-old child gets run over by a car. God wanted to take them to heaven. Your three-year-old child doesn't get run over by a car. Oh, I can't explain that. My theory uniquely predicted that God would want to take that child to heaven. My theory has been falsified. You never hear them say that. <laughs> I've even got a lovely little anecdote along these lines of, you know, I was at a party this one time, and somebody goes up to me, you know, I, I'm trying to explain to somebody what I did for a living when I wasn't talking about human rationality. And he said, um, well, I don't believe you can build artificial intelligence because only God can make a soul. And at this point, I must have been divinely inspired because without any forethought whatsoever, I replied on the spot, you mean if I can make an artificial intelligence that disproves your religion? And he said, what? <laughs> and I said, well, either your religion permits the possibility that artificial intelligence exists, or if I make an artificial intelligence, that disproves your religion. So there's this pause, and you can sort of see the sudden realization that he had made a testable prediction. <laughs> and he immediately goes, oh no, well, I didn't like quite mean that. I meant like it couldn't have emotions the same way we did. So I go, oh, you mean if I can make an artificial intelligence with human-like emotions, that disproves your prediction. Uh, that, that disproves your religion. And we go back and forth until he finally goes something along the lines of, well, I don't believe you can make something eternal. And, you know, like sort of backpedaling away, he suddenly realizes that by saying one thing is mandated by his religion, he has excluded the other things and actually focused his probability mass you know, which is a very good thing if your prediction comes true. But, of course, he doesn't actually expect it to come true, which is the sort of like much deeper failure mode that I'm not going to go into because it could take over the entire talk. But it really is fascinating to look at these people who say one thing and expect another. The sort of fundamental force that makes it difficult to realize what your theory actually predicts is hindsight bias. So, for example, subjects were presented with histories of unfamiliar incidents, like a conflict between the Gurkhas and the British in 1814. Five groups were asked what probability they would have predicted in advance for four outcomes. British victory, Gurkha victory, stalemate without peace, and stalemate with a peace settlement. So, there, the group that was not told which outcome had occurred in every case assigned lower probabilities to the possibility than a group which was told that some particular outcome had occurred. So if you're told that the British won, you'll think it's 57% probable that, the, that you would have predicted that the British win. If you're not actually told that that's what happened, you assign 33% probability that the British win. And so on down the diagonal. So there was, a, and there was another experiment done based on an actual legal case which had occurred, in which two groups had to estimate the probability of flood damage from blocking a drawbridge, and the instructions, um, in, in, like ice block, probability of ice blocking a drawbridge in winter causing flooding, and the instructions stated that the city was ne legally negligent if the foreseeable probability was greater than 10 percent. So 76% of the group told only the background that had actually been known to the city at the time the city actually decided not to hire a watchman, um, concluded that the flood was too unlikely. 57% of the group told that flooding had occurred, concluded that the city was legally negligent. Then they took a third group and told the third group 
um, about the hindsight bias, instructed them to try avoiding the hindsight bias, told them that flooding had occurred, and 56% of that group concluded that the city was legally negligent. Difference, not significant. The moral is, just being told about the hindsight bias doesn't actually really change anything because when you're committing the hindsight bias, you're not saying to yourself, gee, I think I'll go off and commit the hindsight bias right now. <laughs> so trying not to commit the hindsight bias doesn't actually do anything as a cognitive operation, you see. A lot of these are a bit more difficult to, to ameliorate than just telling the subjects about them. So, again, the strength of what a theory is, the strength of a theory is not what it can explain, but what it can't. And after the fact, it's pretty difficult to notice what our theory would have predicted in advance. Like, if you be believed in God, and you had never seen Earth, and you asked yourself, what sort of world would a benevolent God create? You would not come up with this. <laughs> or, if you would come up with this, remind me never to visit your house. <laughs> but once you've already gotten a good look at this world, it's too late to know what your, th what your theory would have predicted. Um, children are the only ones who actually still know what the God hypothesis predicts. They know how they'd make the world. They haven't gotten a good look at it yet. I'm, I have time. I'm even going to go briefly into the sort of underlying math of Occam's razor, the under, like the sort of universal version of minimum message length. You formalize your hypothesis as a computer program H, which outputs your predictions. That is, you don't say what H predicts. H says what H predicts when you run it on a computer. You would, if you wanted to formalize the God hypothesis, you would actually have to write in the lines of code um, that would describe God's decision process in deciding to create Alzheimer's disease. You encode H as a string of ones and zeros in a formal programming language, not in English. The Komolger of complexity is the length of the string. It's a sort of basic measure of computational complexity. The prior probability of a hypothesis goes as 2 to the negative Komolger of complexity, which means that when you talk about all possible computable hypotheses, your probabilities add up to 1 or less. If you choose a perfect encoding where no string is a prefix of any other string and all prefix free strings are computer programs, blah, blah, blah. You, the, the prior probabilities add up to exactly one. The notion being, your probabilities, can't, you, like you can't say, well, it's 60% probable that I'll slip in a puddle and 60% probable that I won't slip in a puddle. The mutually exclusive possibilities have to add up to 1.0 probability. And then Solomon off induction is to consider all possible computable hypotheses and reweight them based on how well they predicted the previous data using Bayes' theorem, which Richard Carey will talk about tomorrow. It's this big scary equation over here. And the moral is there is a correct probability to assign to astrology based on its prior complexity and lack of strong evidence. If you assign more probability to astrology than that, you're assigning the wrong probability, which is a sin. And Bayes will send you to hell. It's Bayesian hell, where nothing ever happens the way you expect. And all your predictions keep on turning out wrong, even taking into account your previous experience. Conversely, if one were to assign less probability to astrology than Solomon of induction calls for, you know, like this big old equation over here, or the best we can approximate it using our feeble human approximations like scientific induction and so on, 
you would be assigning too low a probability to astrology. And you wouldn't be a virtuous skeptic for assigning lower probability to astrology than the math calls for, bearing in mind that we're talking with a number with a whole lot of zeros after the decimal point. But nonetheless, if you put too many zeros after the decimal point, you wouldn't be a virtuous skeptic who is getting a good kick in on, on those crazy astrologer enemy guys. You'd be doing the wrong math, which is a sin. <laughs> and contrast this notion of the correct probability to assign something versus what I call the authority model of knowledge. You have met people who think like this. They, they're sort of, their model of knowledge is sort of like, it's the stuff you learn in school, and sometimes the teacher says something, and you have to agree with that, and you have to memorize, and you have to write it back down in the test, or you will be graded low. And then there are things that other students in class say, which you're allowed to disagree with and make up your own opinion. And that which is certain is like something the teacher says, you have to agree with it, and that which is said to be uncertain is just a theory. You're allowed to make up your own opinions, and no one can disagree with you because that which is uncertain feels unauthoritative. Um, for example, someone says like, well, but you can't prove I won't win the lottery. There's still a chance, right? You know, in other words, as long as it's not certain that they won't win the lottery, they're allowed to go buy a lottery ticket. which is a sort of special case in turn, I think, of the fallacy of gray. Um, Mark Stiegler summarized this uh, as, the world isn't black or, and white. No one does pure good or pure bad. It's all gray. Reply, knowing all, only gray, you conclude that all grays are the same shade. You mock the simplicity of the two-color view, yet you replace it with a one-color view, <laughs> of which the moral is, everything is uncertain. That's what it means to be a user of probability theory. You assign probabilities to everything that is logically possible. And if you are a, and if you are a really advanced philosopher, you assign things, probabilities to things, some of which are logically impossible, but which are not known to you to be logically impossible. I mean, what's the probability that 38,928,223 is prime? I mean, either it is or it isn't, but I don't know. It's a subjective uncertainty, even though reality has only a single answer. So everything is uncertain in the mathematician's world. But, this is the important point, it's not all the same shade of uncertainty. There are, there are shades of gray which are so light as to be almost white, like the sun will rise tomorrow. There are shades of, it's not absolutely certain, Aliens could arrive and blow up the sun over the next 24 hours, but one must distinguish possibility from probability. By naming one counter-possibility, you have not refuted the certainty of my theory and ensured that there is no controlling authority that makes you believe things. You've just cited an extremely improbable possibility that only should slice a like, tiny little amount off the degree of credibility we assign to something. I've even seen this sort of bad habit, not just in um, people who come from sort of wooish backgrounds where you spend all day coming up with ways not to notice that something is a lie and so have developed extremely sophisticated ways of defending lies, but even sort of, sort of like what I call anti-epistemology, but even from sort of academic backgrounds where they're playing gotcha with a scientific paper. Ooh, they didn't consider this possibility. And even from there, like you don't have people distinguishing possibility and probability. So the moral, and I think I'm pretty much out of time for this talk if I want to have any time left for questions, is that the rabbit hole goes deeper. There is this vast edifice of probability theory and decision theory and the cognitive science of human errors and the practical methods of rationality yet to be learned even after correctly making fun of astrology. <laughs> no, because I think there's this trap in skepticism 
where you congratulate yourself a little too early. You're like, yeah, I know there's, astrology doesn't work. I know there's no God. And there isn't. And this is important because there's people still buying homeopathic medicine and dying. But you're still shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, really, these issues are not that hard in an absolute sense. It's only our own insanity that makes the question even difficult. The state of evidence on the God question is pretty similar to the state of evidence on the werewolf question, <laughs> as the saying goes. That, I didn't invent that saying. Um, it's Santa Claus for grown-ups is another well-known saying. The, the point is, like, a relatively small amount of clear thinking and weighing the evidence is going to get you past that. You don't need the math. You don't need the cognitive science. You're not really being challenged. So the sort of resolution I want to present to you is that go on making fun of religion. It's important. People, as long as people think that the choice to be religious is this sort of solemn, serious choice that other people take seriously. There's sort of no, no cost to their status. So you can have the sort of accommodationist, non-accommodationist debate, and I think we should have like a lot of, both a lot of serious people engaging with the religious people and engaging with them in serious dialogue, and also enough people making vocal fun and making it clear that they think religious people are stupid, that you know, their sort of hind brain says, wait a minute, if I say something religious, some of my friends will think I'm stupid, is I think the sort of like overall, but that's a bit controversial, I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nonetheless, while we're doing that, also go off and tackle some more challenging issues and learn some more of all that background science. And which you can do at lesswrong.com or just Google rationality, um, which should send you both to my personal web pages and to Less Wrong and to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, the most popular Harry Potter fan fiction online. Yes, really. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any time remaining for questions? We don't. All okay. right. We have time for one question. It says 48. We should have like two minutes left on this thing. No? All right. The, the question is why, and the answer is why not. I've answered a question. <laughs> <laughs>